members. Uh, mm -hmm. Principal Madam is already there. Uh, and um, Dr. Chaya Panse is our principal. Uh, Dr. Vaishali Sumar, Madam, Hi. good morning. <laughs> Good head morning. of zoology department and we have dr golden godro sir who's from secon his principal scientist from secon good morning everyone good morning good morning smita good morning good morning ma'am uh, shall we start madam yeah, we have started uh, live streaming so those who cannot join zoom they will watch this session on youtube yeah absolutely yeah. fair enough yeah uh, and yeah. for students, uh, we have put it in the classroom so they can sit. Otherwise, everybody is uh, mobile echoes. Right. So right. we are showing on the screen on in the classroom. Perfect. Yes, yes we can go ahead, Comrade Madam. Thank you. Komal, we can start. Okay. Am I audible, Madam? Yes. yes. You are. Uh, before heading towards the program, I would like to request all the participants to keep their mics switched off during the seminar. A very good morning to one and all. I am the host of today's program, Ms. Komal Balakrishna Monkar, an assistant professor in BMS EM department of MD College. Respected dignitaries of today's program, Ms. Smita Gyan Olivu, Madam, Manager Grants, the Habitat Trust, Dr. Chaya Panse, Madam, Principal of MD College, or Dr. Goldin Quadro, Sir, Principal Scientist, NVIS second Tamil Nadu, Dr. Manisha Acharya Madam, Vice Principal of Science, Dr. Heman Sharma Sir, Vice Principal of Commerce, Dr. Maithili Mukund Madam, Vice Principal of Arts, Dr. Vaishali Suhuni Madam, Head of Department of Zoology, my fellow colleagues from MD College and all the enthusiastic students participating in today's program. I welcome you all on behalf of Manal College for today's program, the survival of the smallest Indian primate, the Slender Loris, which is organized by BMS EME and Zoology Department in collaboration with NVSEC on Tamil Nadu. We are celebrating Azadi Ka Amrit Mohotsav with Women of Matter talk series. The Women of Matter talk series is in collaboration with Envis Center Second Tamil Nadu. The Institute is taking this initiative with guidance and support from Envis. I would also like to mention over here that today's session is the 75th session of Women of Matter talk series. Today's talk is on the survival of the smallest Indian primate, this lender loss. Many people are not aware of this animal, Slender Loris, which is from the same group to which we humans belong to. And Miss Meeta Madam has been taking great efforts to protect this animal. May I now request our principal, Dr. Chaya Panse Madam, who has been the inspiration for this session to formally welcome our guest for the day. Madam? Madam, you are on mute. Ah. Okay, thank you, Komal. Respected Vice Principals of Mershi Dayanand College, Head of the Zoology Department, Dr. Vaishali Somni, Coordinator of the BMS Section, Dr. Harshada Kohli Satam, uh, our collaborator, Dr. Golden Quadros from Envis Sacon, our today's guest, the 75th speaker of our uh, uh, series on of Adavika Amrit Motsa, uh, Miss Smita Gyan Olivu. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and my dear students, I welcome you all to this last session of our uh, uh, 75 lecture series on environment, sustainable development, and biodiversity. Madam, uh, we started this way back last year after uh, our Prime Minister Honorable Modi ji declared it as Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav and uh, with collaboration from SECON, we, in, in this center of SECON, we decided to have 75 lectures by women of matter. So all our speakers were women and we had various topics right from carbon footprint about nature conservation. We had uh, a literature, the English department carrying out literature, uh, how the literature is involved with conservation of nature, history department through scriptures, uh, conserving environment. We had talked by 
इकोनॉमिक्स ऑल 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 डिपार्टमेंट इकोनॉमिक्स कॉमर्स अकाउंट्स टू नेम इट हिंदी मराठी इंग्लिश केमिस्ट्री एंड द टॉपिक्स फॉर बायोडाइवर्सिटी क्लाइमेट चेंज वी ऑल्सो हैड डाइवर्सिटी ऑफ द केव्स वी हैड डाइवर्सिटी ऑफ रॉक पूल वी बिगैन आर फर्स्ट लेक्चर विथ स्पाइडर्स एंड नाउ टूडे वी विल बी एंडिंग विथ स्लेंडर लॉडिस to give you a brief idea about our college we are a 60 year old institute in the heart of city of mumbai that is paril and we have about 8 and a half thousand students studying in different sections of the society a, a different section of the college that is art science commerce we also have professional courses like computer science mass media Uh, banking insurance uh, bms that is management studies accounts and finance financial markets etc we have post graduation in chemistry zoology and commerce we have phd in hindi marathi english chemistry zoology uh, then we have uh, 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 in commerce and management we have in mathematics and our college is an a grade uh, college accredited by nac and we also won the best college award in the year 2014 as best college adjudged by the mumbai university we were the best in the mumbai university we have got students who are doing very well in academics rank holders especially from the bms department we also our college is known for dramatics and uh, sports so most of our a students take part in drama they take admission to the college because they want to the, be the part of marathi drama and big stalwarts are there now today on the screen like shivaji sarth mankush choudhary bharat jadhav neelam shirke rutuja bagwe last year our student has got award for um, best producer of a film called bardo and um, uh so our students are not only acting but they are in writing they are in music they are in backstage and entire theater activities are covered by our students and they have reached great heights where sports is concerned we are known for kabaddi and kho kho so we have got around 35 shiv chhatrapati award winners for this game and we have few arjun awards few eklavya awards few years back two of us students represented the international kabaddi game and they have got one crore each one was suvarna bhartakke another was abhilasha mathre uh, one crore award from the chief minister uh, uh, we have different competitions like mr and miss university and in the at university level for consecutive 7 8 years we are bagging the miss university and mr university prize or the runner up prize every year so this is a small background and uh, uh, we are doing a lot towards environment we have a um, uh, association called environment association we have an international collaboration with uh, a global law college in sweden and we have an international exchange program where 20 students from sweden are here in md college we host them in mumbai and uh, do all activities related to environment similarly our students go to sweden and they host us there and different activities about sustainable development green environment these projects are taken up in sweden by our students so we also have an active nature club so lot of activities seed collection drive cleaning up the beaches Uh, taking them for uh, uh, field travels uh, free field work uh, excursion these all are being taken up by the department where environment is concerned so madam with this brief idea i welcome you as the 75th woman of matter and i've heard that you're doing a lot of work on slender loris and uh, very few people work in this area and uh you are one of them and eagerly looking forward to listen to you thank you and welcome you once again uh, thank you so much madam madam your address provided a perfect platform for today's seminar now i request dr goldin quadro sir to address the gathering sir 
yeah good morning everybody it is uh, really a pleasure that we are coming at the you know the last session almost uh, having covered the entire journey of 75 different sessions by women who really matter now uh, this was something that was uh, special you know uh, having this kind of a program we usually feel that you know if research or something is there then it is only that you know it is a male domain that is not the case if you see over the years it has been women have contributed immensely and a country has grown with that so what better way than you know celebrate the talks and the lectures you know their experiences their field experiences their life experiences that uh, went that they've gone through and you know and uh, it becomes a learning and a sharing for everyone that is what uh, we aim at and that is how this uh, concept of you know the women matter series uh, started uh, we had a discussion i had a discussion with the uh, the principal of zoology college um, as well as uh, uh, dr vaishali somani uh, the head of zoology department and uh, that is how you know it all culminated into this program and uh, it has been a good journey we got uh, the entire college uh, you know getting together and arranging the several departments very enthusiastically contacting several ladies across uh, different uh, spheres like it was not just science that was covered there was also literature there was history there was geography you know several aspects you think about it and you have it uh, there is lot of work that you know um, our women have done and they have shared and uh, at this moment over here as we have the 75th lecture i'm, I'm glad that uh, we have with us uh, um, this talk on uh, the slender rolls today so i'm looking forward to it and uh, i welcome you to this uh, 75th lecture on uh, Uh, this women of matter series yeah thank you so much yeah. uh, thank you so much sir i now request dr harshada koi satam madam to introduce us with our today's guest speaker over to you madam thank you komal good afternoon everyone myself dr harshada koi satam it's my pleasure to introduce madam smita in this session ms smita ganoliu is a wildlife biologist and a doctor nocturnal primatologist and has ran 13 projects on topics such as slender loris climate change to environmental conservation and human wildlife interactions management in india uh, she is completing her phd in behavior ecology of the malabar slender loris loris uh, lidicarianus malabaricus in its natural habitat and has been researching the ecology behavior threats and conservation of the slender loris in india Madam Smita has been labeled as a change maker by the Pollination Seed Grant for her work on the illegal trades of slender lorries for the purpose of black magic and traditional medicines. She is also a commission member of the IUCN Primate Specialist Group Section for Human Primate Interactions and an executive member of the Association of Indian Primatologists. a project partner for primatologists from around the world including those from the oxford university madam has received the women scientist fellowship from the department of science and technology ministry of science and technology and other prestigious grants such as primate action fund from the margot mash biodiversity foundation she has also served as a wildlife consultant and capacity building expert for developing human wildlife interface management strategies and action plans with the indo german technical cooperation commissioned by the german federal ministry for economic cooperation and development and has been instrumental in the training for forest department officials students in their undergraduate and postgraduate programs um, currently madam is working as a manager for grants in the habitat trust madam we are highly grateful to have you as a resource person for today's program i welcome you on the behalf of md college to share your thoughts on the topic now i request you to start the session and i hand over the session to you uh thank you uh thank you ma'am harshada ma'am thank you principal ma'am for the wonderful uh, welcome uh i feel so happy to be among you all i have been working on the slender lorises for a decade now and i would love to share a little bit of my work with you uh can i share the screen would that be yeah yes sure just... 
Um, I don't think my screen can be, no, my screen, um, I'm unable to share my screen. No, it uh, says you have started sharing the screen. Yeah, but I am unable to, okay. I'm unable to see my screen here. Okay, can you see now? Yeah, we can see, we can see. All right. So uh, I'm just going to start my uh, talk. Uh, first, I'm going to begin by sharing what are the lorises, you know, and how we uh, as primates are different from other uh, animals in, 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 in the entire world. And then I'm going to talk about my journey. And I'm going to then uh, resort to talking about the key findings of my research, which kind of changed the perspective of primates from India. So first, let me begin with the basic, basic, what are primates? See, any, uh, any organism that whose arms can rotate, you know, and they can touch the shoulder joint, or they have relatively long fingers and toes, a strong clavicle, nails instead of claws, binocular vision, and a well-developed cerebrum, these would be classified as the primates. These are the basic features that we look in primates. So, Can you all hear? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I had a little technical issue that had gone. So, can you can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hello. Yes, now yes, we can, can hear. Okay, so I'm just going to continue from. Okay. Can be classified into three groups. One is the primates. This is, the piece, this is largely all the primates around you. All the monkeys are, um, are classified under monkeys. And then you have the apes. The apes are the orangutan, the gibbons, and including us. We also come under the apes category. So these are the large three categories uh, that we see in primates. Where okay, does the laws fit in? So now the first the apes, the lemurs, the babies, they came to being. Because around the time the dinosaurs were coming to extinct, around that time. And then you have the old uh, and we came at the last. So this is how broadly the evolution happened. Now, the primates are not spread out across the world. You only see them in a uh, few regions, that is the central regions around the equator. And uh, lorises are found uh, in, uh, if you can see, they are only more about where they are seen uh, in parts of India and Sri Lanka. And their close cousins, the lemurs, their close cousins are the lemurs which are found in Madagascar. The, they are in, uh, in endemic to Madagascar and nowhere else. So these are the close cousins of the lorises. Now, what are these lorises that I'm talking about? Okay, there are two types of lorises. One is the slow loris, which is quite large, like you can see in the picture. And then you have the slender loris. They're quite small and slender. Well, and you can see that there are around nine to 10, uh, right now, here I'm displaying nine, but now the species has increased. Uh, so there are about 10 species of slow lorises, but where there are only two species of slender lorises. So slender loris, you have the gray slender loris and the red slender loris. Now, where are the slow lorises? The slow lorises are found in India, they're found in the Northeast, and then they are spread across Indonesia and Vietnam in that region. So they are found in South and Southeast Asia. They're spread quite well. And there are many species of uh, slow lorises. In India, you find the Bengal slow loris, which is around two kgs. They're quite large. 
and the slender lorises. Slender lorises, you have the grey slender loris that is distributed in India and few parts of Sri Lanka. But the red slender loris is critically endangered and they are found only in Sri Lanka, in one small patch of Sri Lanka. That's where you find the red slender loris. Okay, now the difference between the slow loris and the slender loris. This is very important because um, as I proceed um, in my presentation, you will understand the significance of understanding the difference between the two lorises. Slow lorises are really large. They are like teddy bears. They, the smallest slow loris is 85 grams. So you can see that they are quite large. In India, the Bengal slow lorises are the biggest among all, and they are around two kilos, which is like really large. You can cuddle with them. Whereas the slender loris, the biggest slender loris would be only 390 grams. So they are the small, as small as your palm. They're very small sized. And uh, the slow loris have a small tail. Slender lorises do not have a tail. Now, why is it significant to know if they have a tail or not? Because the entire ecology and their behavior changes from all the other primates. So which I will cover again in detail in the, in the, in the further slides. So uh, just to differentiate, the slow lorises do have a small tail. And the slender lorises have no tail. The slow lorises are the only venomous primates on earth. So their venom, they have venom. So what they do is they have the saliva in the mouth and they have a branchial gland, which is under their armpit, on, on their armpit. So what they do is they, when they are under threat or they want to use their venom, they rub their mouth on the armpit and get the venom. And the mixture of the saliva and those excruciates makes a venom which they inject into the prey. Either the prey or during uh, fights between uh, the individuals. And sometimes when uh, the uh, human beings are handling the slow loris, they even bite the human being. So uh, no deaths have been reported of uh, the slow loris venom in human beings, but it does cause an anaphylactic shock and a humongous amount of uh, infection in the area of the bite. But uh, slender lorises do bite. They do have a very nasty bite, uh, which can dig deep into your bones, but they do not have any venom in their uh, bite. So lethal bite, yes, the slow lorises can kill you if your anaphylactic shock is uh, not being handled well by your body. It can kill you, but uh, slender lorises bite will not kill you. Uh, slow lorises are majorly vegetarian. They do eat a little amount of non-veg, but uh, slender lorises are majorly non-vegetarian. They are insectivores. They do eat a large variety of insects and small uh, uh, lizards and uh, um, spiders and so small arthropods and reptiles. So this is the major difference between the slow loris and slender loris. Now, when you see the slender lorises, although there are, uh, like I said, there are only two species, we have uh, six subspecies. Now, among the uh, six subspecies, two are in India. These are the two in India. So we have only gray slender lorises in India. And uh, both the gray slender lorises are uh, um, situated in South India. And we have only two in India, whereas the other four are situated in Sri Lanka. Okay, so now these are the two red slender lorises. Now you can see that though uh, they're nocturnal, right? So they're, they're, uh, the grayness of the fur is quite very similar. So if you see, these are the two red slender loris and these are the four gray slender loris. So this is the red and this is gray. Now, how do you make out the difference? For slow lorises, it is easier to make out the difference because they look remarkably different from each other. Their eye patches are different. Their uh, fur color is different. The sizes are different. But then if you see the slender lorises, all six subspecies look very similar to each other. Now, why is it very important to make sure that they are that we identify the lorises. Now, how do we identify the lorises? So we look at the circumocular patch, the patch around the eyes. So we see how big the patch is around the eyes, what is the color of the patch around the eyes, and what is the uh, shape, whether it is round or circumocular or uh, diamond shape. And we also look at this uh, um, rim in between the eyes, the distance, how much of whiteness is there, and we see a patch at the bottom, like on the cheek. So we look at how much um, the coloration or uh, lack of coloration exists on the patch at the bottom of there uh, on the cheek. So this is the 
only classification or the identification for identifying the difference between subspecies. Now, in, in, in India, we have two subspecies. So let's just concentrate on the one that is in India. Uh, in, we have the Mysos nandalorus, which if you see this patch around the eyes, it is like a dollar. It is like a uh, drop of water. So it is like a, um, so it is, it is, it is got a pointing edge on the top and it is like a uh, drop of water. Whereas if you see the Malabar slendolaris, the patch is very round and circum. So, and um, the Mysus nandalorises are larger, Malabar nandalorises is smaller. Now, if you're wondering the which one is there in Mumbai, you have the Malabar nandalorises, the one that I did my PhD on. In fact, uh, mine is the only PhD uh, in the world uh, on the Malabar nandalorises. So, um, the one that you find in Mumbai is the Malabar nandalorises, the smaller one. Okay, so now why the lorises? Why when we have so many lesser known species uh, in, in India, why did I select the lorises? So this is where I'm just going to give a small story about my journey. So when I, uh, a decade ago, more than a decade ago in 2009, when I was working with the IASC, I was part of the rehabilitation uh, group who were rehabilitating, rescuing and rehabilitating squirrels and other wild animals. So my, my job was to rehabilitate the squirrels, uh, bring them up to age and then release them back into the wild. So during this, while well, uh, unintentionally, we rescued the slender loris. Now, when we rescued the slender loris, it was so tiny and nobody would imagine a primate to be so tiny. There was not much information that was available online. So we assumed it's a baby. And we gave it some um, uh, uh, milk uh, formula, you know, the formula that we give to the wild animals. The loris was not happy about it. It was not lapping up the milk. Then we, I gave it some bananas and it did eat a little bananas, but it was not too happy. So one of the co-rescuers, uh, uh, she was working on fig insects. So then she offered some of the flies and the lorises lapped them up. And we were still trying to find out what the age of the loris was and what kind of primate it was, how to, we, we just wanted to find out basic details about the lorises, which we were not able to find out. And uh, that's when we, uh, we figured out that what we had was an adult after we contacted a lot of people. So this curiosity took me into the forests of the Western Ghats, where I wanted to study the one subspecies that no one had worked on till date. So uh, I got to understand that we did have some amount of information on the Graceland, uh, on the Mysus slendoloris, but no one had worked on the Malabar slendoloris, which was uh, which is distributed across Western Ghats. So this curiosity took me into the forest. But what I assumed would be easy became far more difficult than my assumption. The first thing that I had to get used to was the start was not easy at all. I had to get used to this. I, because I have been in cities all my life, I have not I had not experienced complete darkness. So much darkness that I could not see my hand. So this is the first step to studying any nocturnal animal, especially the slender loris. One, we understood that we have to go by walk. I had to go by walk into the forest, get used to the darkness and use this light. Red, um, low illumination, red light. So this was how we went into the forest. And the white light, like you saw, the white light just came. That is the SOS light or we use, that is the only line of defense. Can you all hear, madam? I cannot hear her. No, madam, even we cannot hear. She has got stuck, I guess. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Hello can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the first step to my research, okay, for my research, we cannot hear you, Smita. Smita, we cannot hear you. I think there is some technical issue at uh, Madam's side. Uh, she may rejoin again. 
yes yes some technical issue Parshada madam, if you can contact her over phone, you may understand what is the problem. Yes, madam. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, madam has got the internet issue. She is logging in back. Okay, okay. You can't help with this. I'm so sorry. I have a very shaky internet today. I'm just going to share my screen again. Uh, I'm okay. So I'm just going to repeat from before this uh, from here. Um, I hope, I hope I have spoken. So curiosity is yes, the We could see the video. Smita, you can see the video. Okay. So I can, I can start from here, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, like I said, the first step to my study was to get used to the darkness. And, uh, when I started my work, there was nobody working on nocturnal animals. So I had to figure out a way where I could get used to the darkness understand uh, the presence of animals in the night uh, because I could determine the difference by the smell. So the presence of, uh, for example, if there is an elephant right next to me, the only way I could find out is smell and the intensity of the smell, I had to calculate the distance between me and the elephant and which direction it's coming from. And my only mode of... Uh, um, the only way I could protect myself was uh, by using white light. So the white light, the shine that you comes now, that is my only mode of communication or protection or anything. So this is this was how it all began. Okay. So when I started off with this lorises, it was not like I went into the forest for the first time and suddenly found a loris and started my work. No, it took me a month to actually locate or find my first loris. And the particular night after a month of surveys, the particular night when I was looking for a loris, I, we were looking from 10 in the night to 2 a.m. And I was completely exhausted and I was sitting under a tree when I asked my tracker to just go around and see if he can find a loris. And when he was coming back, he started screaming, ma'am, 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 look up, look up, look up. And I looked up and that's when a loris was peeping down at me. It was right there. I was sitting right below it. And I still couldn't know that the loris is there. So that's when I realized from the first one month, I realized that nocturnal animals first rely on sound. When they hear something, they rely on sound. And then on smell, they'll come closer and smell you. And only then they see you. So we did small, small experiments in, in the beginning to understand, okay, how do we uh, make sure the probability of spotting the lorises is more. So we kind of like, in general, all 
all uh, activities in the forest, all surveys, you have to maintain pin drop silence. But on the contrary, we realize that we might have to use some, um, create some no um, sound and not noise. There's a difference between noise and sound. So we had to tailor make a few whistle sounds that I can make which will increase the curiosity and the lorises come out and then the lorises smell us. So we had uh, uh, all my volunteers use where the lorises were habituated to me and my smell. So the uh, my volunteers had to use clothes that I had reused so that my smell is on them. So all kinds of permutations and combinations had to be done. And if we spotted like one or two lorises per night, which is like um, the throughout the night when we do service, we spot two lorises, we used to think that we hit a jackpot. It was that difficult to spot the lorises. And this is how much we can see. This is on a very good night when we have very good visual. This is how much of a loris we can see. So the, the, the lorises happen to be one of the most difficult uh, primates or mammals to work on um, in globally. And, uh, and this is on a very good night, uh, day when a loris came down, this is one of the habituated lorises, it came down when I whistled and this is how much you can see of the loris. This is a loris, this is how small they are and this is how much you can see. Okay, okay, now let's get back to the lorises. Okay, so you, now, like I said, we have two different kinds of lorises. One is the Malabar slender loris, and then you have the Mysus slender loris. Now, along the red, the red section, if you see uh, along the Western Guards, the entire West, uh, Western Guards, you have the uh, Malabar slender loris, and then the rest of the Deccan Plateau uh, and along the Eastern Guards, you have the uh, Mysus slender loris. Now, why is it very important to know the difference between the Malaba and the uh, Mysore is because they do not interbreed. I mean, till now we have not found any evidence of them interbreeding. And two, they are uh, geographically isolated. So it is possible that if you release them in the wrong habitat, you might land up killing the animal. They might not survive. So it is very essential because we did not find any places where they were overlapping. Uh, so that is the reason it is very essential to know the difference between the two. Um, okay, so the Malabar slender loris is very small. It is around 180 grams, 180 grams. It's really small. You can see that the size of the loris is almost the size of the leaf. Whereas the Mysore slender loris is slightly bigger. They are 400 grams, but still small. Um, and because they do not have a tail. Why were we talking about the tail? The tail helps you to jump. The tail helps the primates to balance while jumping. Because the lorises do not have a tail, they are incapable of jumping. And because they cannot jump, they have to have a continuous canopy. So to get from one tree to another tree, in case the both the trees are not touching each other, they have they will have to get down to the floor and cross on the ground and then climb the other tree. There is no way they can jump from one tree to another tree like other primates do. And for astonishingly, the lorises do not like to be inside deep forest. They prefer to be around human people human. So they need a little bit of human disturbance in their habitat, which is a very astonishing feature because uh, if you see the lesser known species and the very shy species prefer to stay away from human habitation. But on the contrary, the lorises were greatly found in the edges of the forest or among human habitation or where you see a large amount of human disturbance. For example, if you see this last photograph, you will see that there are a lot of creepers and ingrowth here in this habitat. Now, this is because of the human disturbance. When you have the human disturbance, you have better penetration of light and then you have other creepers and um, the undergrowth and understory uh, growing up. So this, this is a moist deciduous forest, a perfect habitat for the lorises and uh, this is where we did our study in the night. So this is the pathways I was walking in the night. And yes, they need complete uh, canopy where they can move from one place to another. Their eyes are super sensitive to light. 
they just cannot handle even a small amount of light that is the reason we use red light nocturnal animals it is proven uh, by uh, many research that nocturnal animals cannot see red and hence the usage of low illumination red light is creating very minimum disturbance to the lorises almost negligible and that is the reason we use very little light uh, they prefer extreme darkness in the night and they also sleep in wine tangles so these uh, wine tangles that you see in this picture so these are the natural nests and this is where they sleep in the night so okay so if you see the morphology of the lorises see one they have very very sensitive eyes and uh, but they cannot see red and they have really large eyes uh, so even small amount of light like the flash of the camera like in this uh, photo i'm using the flash of the camera also can disturb their um, eyesight uh, they are tailless there you see there's no tail the limbs are very short and slender and that is why they call the slender loris they cannot jump and the adults, this is the Malabar slender loris. The picture is of a Malabar slender loris. It is as small as a squirrel, the three palm, uh, the three striped palm squirrel. So they are as small as the squirrel because you have all seen uh, in the daytime. I'm, I'm sure everybody would have seen the small uh, squirrels. So their size is uh, comparable with the squirrels. And males are smaller than the females. Now, if you see here, people always assume that this is uh, on the left is a female because of the protrusion and on the right and uh, no, on the left is a male that is what people assume because all males have a protrusion that in the genital area but on the contrary this is a very primitive animal extremely primitive and they have only the females have a protrusion for example here the females with two babies so the females have a protrusion the females are larger and the males are smaller which is contrary to all the other primates and all the animal kingdom that we have seen. Normally in the animal kingdom, the females are smaller and the males are larger. But this is so primitive that the females are larger, almost double the size of the males, and the females have a protrusion. So this is a confusion that is created in all rescue centers. So this is the truth. Okay. And this is how a loris moves from one tree to another tree. So this is how close the tree has to be. So this is one tree to another tree. They cannot jump. And you can see it is a female. It has a protrusion and this is a female. And you can also observe that the size of the leaf, this is a rainforest and the size of the leaf and the loris is not too far away. So they're very tiny, small mammals or primates. So yes, and hence the canopy has to be continuous for the lorises. Okay. Okay, so uh, why is loris uh, conservation very important? One, the Easter cycle of the loris uh, comes only twice a year and it lasts only 24 hours. So the males and the loris have rituals which last more than a month where the males are uh, trying to approach multiple females and trying to uh, pair with the female. But the actual copulation can happen only within 24 hours when the loris is in, uh, in heat. So at that moment, it is very important that we do not create any disturbances. And the and um, it is a polygon andrus mating system. Uh, you have multiple males pursuing multiple females and they have a very lengthy, long mating ritual. But the mating happens only for 24 hours. And the mating happens where the female is hanging upside down from the branch and the male will hang on the female and mate with the female. And they have a very uh, different vocalizations during the mating uh, season. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't record it because I myself in my tenure of six years in the forest, I could see mating only twice. And it happened so quickly that I couldn't record the sound. 
and um, the meeting uh, happens once or twice a year uh, this uh, for the malabarikas it happens only once that is the malabas landlords it happens only once a year for the mysus landlords they do meet twice a year the gestation period is 165 days uh, they have only up to one or two litters and uh, what the lorises do is they carry the young one on them for two months and then they wean them off and the the young one is sent off to find its own uh territory so uh, the lorises are solitary uh they prefer to uh, they have an overlapping home range but they are solitary uh they highly territorial very territorial and uh, the female mothers will ha have their young ones with them only for four months after which the young ones have to find their own territory uh the males will be wandering around trying to mate with different females so they have a larger territory and they keep wandering around mating with multiple females in their uh, range so this is what happens so this is few vocalizations that i thought this is a typical whistle Okay, so this is a typical whistle, uh, which is high pitch, and uh, it's not very clearly visible. Uh, if you are not looking for a loris or trying to listen to the call, you might miss out on the call. But it has a typical high high pitch whistle, and then this is an infant call, which is very different from the typical whistle. Okay, so this is the infant call, and then you have the copulating call. So the copulating cannot hear or no? Can you hear? No. Yeah, in between. Yes, now it's audible. In between you, uh, yeah, in between. Can you now? Hello. Yeah, now we can hear. Speak. Okay, so sorry, I I am in a very remote location, so I have very unstable internet. Okay, uh, I hope you were able to uh, hear the calls. Yeah, most of the calls except the infant call. I couldn't hear the infant call. Oh, you couldn't hear the infant call. Okay, I'll just play it again. So if you hear the infant call, it's just like a insect. So it's like an insect. Smita, madam, we cannot see your PPT. You cannot see my PPT. Okay, I'll just share it again. Can you see my PPT now? Uh, can you see my PPT now? No, not visible. Not visible. Uh, okay, uh, I'll just. Share it again. Uh, now, yes, yes, it's now better. you can see. Okay.
the infant fall is very close to insects yeah yeah very very low intensity yes yes so the typical whistle is high intensity again not very close to our hearing range uh, but the infant call is close to uh, insects and very low intensity but then the copulating calls you see it's very very loud again it's very different from the typical whistle and the infant calls and then you have the growling or fear when they are in fear so they have very different calls for each of their communication making it even more difficult for us to study them okay so moving on mm, i'm unable to go to the next step okay now what do they eat okay so the lorises have a very low metabolic rate that means they can digest a uh, humongous amount of uh, toxins they also have uh, special enzymes in their mouth so they can even eat toxic uh, insects that no other um, animal or no other uh, um, um, phylum can digest so they have a plethora of insects that they can feed on and they have different kind of um, behavior while eating so uh, when they eat many of the insects for example the insects uh, the all these um, uh, horn horn beetle the large horn beetle that you find on the trees while eating them they urine wash them they wash the horn beetle in urine or they urinate and spread spread the urine on their hand and then allow the uh, ants to climb their hand like how the ants are climbing the hand and then they lick up the ants so that is another strategy they have they even smear saliva on um, a few insects but if the insects are biting insects they shake their head violently they sneeze they slobber so they have different strategy to while eating different kinds of insects but because uh we could not do a very detailed study on what strategy is applied for which insect because one they are very small and visibility is very low in the nights but we have uh, noticed that uh, they do urine washing they do saliva smearing even if they defecate they just spread it on the branch so nothing comes down uh so this is how they have while eating um let's talk about the threats डिस्टर्बेंस uh hello can you hear me yeah yeah you can hear me you can hear me right okay sorry uh okay i thought i lost you again so um it is very uh, very strange and astonishing to know that uh, lorises actually do not have any threats uh any natural uh, threats to survive in so many million years so now these are the potential threats that science has uh, said so because based on the predators that is there in the area that the lorises are for example the owls could be a potential threat or the snakes could be a potential threat and then you have the brown palm civet so i did notice a brown palm civet attack a loris but i have never seen uh, it eating it like completely eating it it did take it into the mouth but we do not know if it completely devoured it so it is very unnatural to have no natural threats um uh, but we do not know why maybe because it eats a humongous amount of toxic insects so maybe the flesh is also toxic that could be one of the reason because that is something that is proven in the slow lorises uh but not the slender we have no idea why there are no threats um potential uh, we have only potential threats there are no threats naturally for the in the wild but we do have a lot of man made threats we have lots of man made threats so this is a big part of my study because i was able to bring to light something that uh, was not studied before 
uh, for example, uh, one of the major threats of lorises for lorises are the trade of slender lorises. They are traded both internationally across Indian borders. They are traded nationally and they are traded locally in a uh, habitat. Now, why are they traded? So internationally, we have uh, many evidences, but the problem is because nobody knows of the existence of the lorises, they always have been reported as unknown species, like monkey looking species or a, or a rat looking species, or they have been noted as a bush baby or a young one of a um, slow loris or a thasius. So that is how it has been reported internationally. So we do not know uh, from where lorises have been um, um, international. We know that we, they have found them in international markets, but we do not know where it has come from, whether it has come from India, whether it has come from Sri Lanka, because uh, that is where the identifying um, becomes a big challenge. Um, to, even the reports have always been as some other animal. So we, do not, we know that it's gone abroad. In fact, there is one case that was reported from Thane. We do not know how, where, and no stories, proper information about its uh, uh, crossing the international border. And another big threat is lack of knowledge about the lorises. The animal planet was describing that this is a slow loris. All the description about this slender loris have been slow loris. Now, the, that is also a big problem because globally, uh, the lorises, is, the slender lorises are not known and they have been um, time and again confused with other primates. Now, in national, nationally, we, I, uh, my study brought to light why uh, they have been uh, traded nationally. So, the main reason to why they have been traded is to uh, is because of people's perception and superstitious beliefs. It is not kept as pets. Nobody likes to keep lorises as pets. They have been majorly traded for the reason in traditional medicine. And uh, they like to keep a loris in a box. Uh, not because the, they... Uh, uh, not because they want to maintain it as a pet, but the lorises are taken around by people to drive away bad, bad omen or to cast away bad omen or to predict the future. So in like just the parrots are used, the lorises are also used in uh, fortune telling, astrology, astronomy to drive away bad omen and many other practices. They are used in black magic and they're also used in non-black magic rituals. To go into the details, the different myths that you have about the black, uh, about the lorises, people think they're bad omen. Bad omen means it goes to the extent where there is a small village in the Western Ghats. I do not want to mention who. Now, this community uh, are uh, the, the, the lower class people of this community hunt for their non-vegetarian food. So they had a belief that when they go out for hunting, if they see a loris, then they will not get any fortune in the night. And hence, they, in order to avoid seeing a lorises, they went and uh, removed all the lorises from the area. They hunted down all the lorises and killed the lorises. So that, that led to local extinction of the lorises. Um, there are a few places in Kerala where they believe that uh, when, on seeing, if a woman sees a loris, she becomes barren. And hence, again, that leads to the killing of the lorises. They believe that a lick of the loris can uh, heal any diseases, including cancer. So the lorises are forced to, you know, the box, when the people carry the uh, loris in boxes, they will come and lick on the infected areas. And it is believed to uh, devoid you of the infection. Even cancer, they believe that cancer will go by just the loris licking you. And uh, uh, they believe that uh, eyes of the loris have uh, uh, very good eyesight. It can heal your cataract. And hence, um, potions are uh, taken by uh, using their eyes. So the loris's eyes are pierced when the loris is still alive to um, extract uh, teardrops. So this, when you can see this picture. So when the loris is still alive, they, they take a very hot rod and pierce into the eyes of the loris to extract teardrops. So they use these teardrops to make medicines that can heal your eye, eye ailments or they use it for making hypnotizing uh, uh, kajal, which you can use to cast spell on others and for many other uh, black magic purposes. 
um but the loris is still alive that's the thing the loris they do not kill the loris before this ritual it is still alive so if you can see here the lorises are traded both alive and dead for making for all these different kinds of traditional uh, medicine for example uh, the um, they use the liver of the loris so that is the dead loris they use the liver of the loris for making hypnotizing potions they use the fat of the loris they extract fat from the body of the loris to uh, cure typhoid uh, thyroid and knee joint problems they use the fecal matter to cure leprosy they use the ash of the lorises in many rituals even to kill other people or to cast evil spell on other people uh this, they also maintain the skin and uh, the bones of the loris so the dead uh, the skin and the bones of the loris are dug in, in in the house you know under the house so when you are making a house they dig a hole put the bones in the skin of the loris there and then build a house on that so they have a belief that uh, the presence of the loris there will cast out all the evil so the loris is supposed to take up all the evil and um, devoid the house members of any evil lorises are kept in small boxes inside the houses as well so there there is a belief that in the morning when you see the first thing you see a loris um the loris will take away all your uh, bad omen and your day will go well but these are not kept as pets so they are very ill treated they are known as the demons or they are very close they are considered as the animals of the dark world so they are not uh, fed well they are kept in very poor um, conditions uh like here so uh, you have the astrologer taking the loris around now because the lorises have a really bad nasty bite they use a nail cutter to clip off the uh, teeth so now these lorises have a gap in the teeth so they invariably start putting things in their mouth and that's when the, these teeth uh, the colorful thread is given to them which they put in the mouth and that is sold as uh, good fortune or uh, in different belief system so this is the loris in the box where the 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 astrologer or a person carries the loris around there is also a uh, there is also a ritual which happened in uh, tamil nadu where uh, one man uh, one of these astrologers had a loris and uh, all the clients are supposed to come and uh, cast their uh, uh, tell the loris all the bads that they did and the loris got a very good beating from the astrologer the loris was tied onto a uh, onto um, onto a stick and beaten up on behalf of the client so that the client is devoid of all his sins so such kind of rituals happen and these lorises are in very bad condition because he, they are exposed to broad daylight which they are not supposed to then this is the black magic you can see that the penis the uh, anus is pierced uh, like the voodoo doll so they used as voodoo doll so the anus is pierced there uh, you can see here this is a live loris all these lorises are alive by the way where my, the arms are burnt the mouth is burnt um the joints are broken see here the joints are broken so this is the rescued loris that was beaten up on behalf of the clients um their arms are pierced nails uh, burnt so you have different kinds of rituals so um uh, my recent publication has the entire list of all the rituals that happens on the lorises if you are interested please go ahead and read it uh, i don't want to show too much because this is depressing so what are the challenges that we researchers have been facing to study the loris one is the collection of uh, when it comes to the trade of the lorises uh, it's a taboo topic nobody even talks about the lorises even telling the name of the loris is bringing abshukana or uh, uh, bad omen onto themselves so collecting information about something negative is very difficult so that is uh, we cannot bring about any kind of changes in people's perception unless we know what they are perceiving so even understanding what is their perception is become a challenge uh and uh, we have been trying and to our best knowledge we have been able to collect some some information that i have um, written a paper on but we are sure that every habitat every loris habitat across india and sri lanka have their own perceptions and every perception has a different kind of roots and uh, reaching out would require a humongous amount of uh, help from social scientists who are trained to work among people so uh, as a natural scientist i could only do so much but then this is where i would need help from the trained social scientists to dig deeper and to bring out the perceptions first and then we can figure out how to change the perceptions um none of these perceptions that are from my work in 10 years none of this perception were linked to religion 
that's what i found out it's just black magic and they were not linked to any uh, positive uh, vibration or positive gods so why are they performing these rituals is something that is unknown we know that the rituals are being performed but why and tracking the trade when you no know, when you track the trade you know when the demand is more or when the demand is less well, we know only if the animal enters the pet market then it is easy to cater or track the trade but here because it is being uh, used for black magic and traditional medicine it doesn't even enter the trade market it or the pet market it is it gets exchanged um, among the practitioners itself so that is why it becomes very challenging for us because we do not know when the uh, demand goes high where the demand goes high how do we really correlate it with some kind of ritual that happens there this is something unknown and this is something that needs to be discovered now lorises they have a very peculiar behavior that is when they are frightened they freeze they can freeze for hours together so what happens is most of the trade or trafficking happens where lorises are just put in pockets or in if it is going internationally people have been caught with lorises in their undergarments in their bras and in their uh, in 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 their undergarments you know because they freeze they don't move so it it is very easy to cross the security check with them inside your undergarment so that is how and they are very tiny so nobody will even suspect that you have an animal inside your clothes so that is how most of the lorises have been um, traded nationally and internationally and it's very difficult to find them uh find the traded so it's very difficult to track the route as well now lorises prefer to stay outside the protected areas <laughs> now when the forest department are limited to the protected areas they can make sure nothing happens to the animals that are within the protected areas but now these lorises love to be among human habitation outside the protected areas now how do you protect them what what kind of changes can you bring about to ensure that they are not traded ensure that their numbers don't reduce this is a big bigger challenge and then you have the biggest challenge where the wrong release of rescued lorises so now when a lot of people rescue their lorises more often the lorises get rescued from the same habitat from where their own houses and they released into deep jungles obviously the lorises cannot survive in deep jungle so you are kill, ultimately killing the lorises so this is also wrong release but although they are, the people mean well uh this is a major problem that i have faced in india where even forest department and all the rescuers are releasing them into deep forest where they do not like to stay so this is another and exchange of subspecies all the sub, uh, malabar uh, slender loris gets uh, released in mysore slender loris area and vice versa because they are unable to identify the difference they look very similar and you need specialists to identify the difference so this is where i would like to stop uh, we have had many sponsors over my uh, time i have been partnering with the oxford uh, university where uh, with anna nicaris who is the only other person who has uh, worked on the slender lorises in fact she began initially working on the slender lorises in india and in sri lanka and then uh, i have been associated with professor meva singh the uh, uh, who has helped anna nicaris when she did her work and he has upper hand in uh, all primates he is the father of primatology in india i would call um the madras university uh, who helped me with the, where, that is where i got my phd from and then you have the zoo outreach um, in um, in coimbatore uh, uh, sanjay molur had been very instrumental in especially in uh, in all the resources and uh, i have also got uh, the pro the pollination project grant the department of science and technology that is the women scientist fellowship i have uh, got the rap um the, the rapid action fund from wti after this i got funded from the iucn and many other funds came in but i did not have time to put them up so there it is not a game i didn't i i couldn't have been able to do this really hard research without so many help um both financially and uh, logistically and support from uh, many organizations in india and abroad so thank you uh, i am uh, i am ready to take up questions Any? Should I stop sharing my screen? Hi. So, any questions? 
the session is now open for uh, questions indeed a very exciting elaborative and interesting session madam uh, you shared the challenges that you have faced uh, your uh, uh, exciting moments experiences and also share, you shared the interesting facts about uh, lorises in india uh, as you said that there are clo the lorises will generally prefer habitats which are in close vicinity to human habitats Uh, so, are there any reports of uh, zoonoses or river zoonoses in? Uh, That's the most interesting feature uh, because there are no reports of lorises falling sick. Even when there was an outbreak of uh, Cassino forest diseases, when many of the primates were falling dead right in front of us, we didn't. Uh, there was no reports of any lorises uh, falling dead. The numbers did not change at all. So. Uh, this is something that we have been looking into i wanted to look into but uh, time did not permit uh, and as one single researcher it's difficult to dive into all aspects of science so yes uh, dr arun zakaria was looking into it and we did not find uh, any kind of diseases it's not susceptible to any today's disease i can say we no evidence has been found okay uh, so any, any and very interesting uh, session it was you uh, you said that they release some toxins right the lorises release some toxins the slow but, lorises yeah yeah the uh, yeah but when these people uh, take them in the undergarments and they Yeah, so uh, the slender lorises don't have any toxins. They just have a really nasty bite, so the teeth is removed. And the slow lorises also they teeth removed. They remove the teeth, and what they do is um, the slow lorises are quite larger, and they are also uh, they are also trafficked. But I'm not sure if they're trafficked in their undergarments. The slender lorises are small, very small. So slender lorises don't have toxins in them, uh, in the mouth. Uh, or they don't have venom, so they can be transported very easily. In fact, I have also held a slender, a rescued slender lorus. It will freeze. It will freeze in your arm, and it will stay frozen for hours together. So you can easily transport them. But like us, do the does their dentition grow back? No. No. Acha, once broken, forever broken. Yeah, that's sad. sad. But yes, very sad. And they need, and they need their teeth to dig, uh, to eat the insects. No, because all these hard-shelled insects, they need the teeth to grind them. So it's very sad. Uh, these lorises who don't have teeth, you know, uh, we can't release them back into their the natural habitat. So we're yeah. figuring out some uh, known habitats where we can release them, where we have other diversity of insects. So this is something that we are trying to work with uh, the rescue centers and Tamil Nadu Forest Department. So they are, I'm working very closely with them to find solutions for such problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. If the students have any questions, they can unmute. They can uh, put their question in the chat box, please. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Uh, it, it is, it is, it is a very general one. Yeah, your presentation was very nice and very interesting and really yeah. disturbing, also as uh, you know the slides that you showed and all. But uh, I would like to take you to your very beginning as to, as to you know why why did you select lorises for study? Why did you not select any of the other primates? You know there were more yeah. charismatic primates, easily yeah. visible and you know easily you could track them and all and you know. So why just lorises, which yeah, is difficult to track, about difficult them. to I, you know, stay out yeah, of the I, uh, yeah. I rescued a loris in 2009, and uh, I was so curious. I I couldn't find much information about the loris. Uh, I was very curious. So my curiosity took me into the forest, and I was already married. Um, and I thought, let me do. I wanted to observe them up close for six months. How six months became ten years, I don't know. I even mothered a child in between. <laughs> so as a mother, I used to carry my son to the forest, and night he used to sleep, and I went into the forest in the night. So um, curiosity—that's my only thing. My driving force was curiousness, and I wanted to find out reasons to my own questions. So that's how kept, things kept me going. I hope I answered your question, sir. Yeah. I Yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. That sounds more challenging. Like you know, you accepted yeah. a challenge from a <laughs> curiosity. Yeah, that is good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I was sure answering my will... own questions actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure this will inspire a lot of our young women out there. You know, who are listening to you and uh, 
definitely take up research that is not just easy but also challenging thank you so yes. much yeah uh, there is a question from uh, vaishali madam uh, vaishali sumani madam uh, madam is asking what will be your message to the young researchers especially okay uh, my message would be like do not keep your personal circumstance as a limiting factor just because you are a woman or married or your parents at home are not very confident that shouldn't be limiting if you want to achieve something if you want to walk on a path that's less taken find a way and you can do it i am one of the examples there are many 75 examples that you yourself have seen from last year if 75 women can go against all odds to do what they want to do i'm sure everyone else can it's just time about you know reach out to the resources find out what resources you need take help from the existing resources create new resources and go for it uh, how much of uh, the research is done on especially metabolism of these uh, how much of research is done on what sir metabolism of uh, the yeah. uh not much research so duke university in california had 15 lor- uh, captive malabarikas over a period of time the person who did the research is no more he passed away so he did some captive work but because it is done on captivity you know in captivity in controlled conditions where you give the insects you know you introduce the insects it's not very uh, i wouldn't say is mal- very reliable but yes there is one research that was done in the 90s 1980 1996 2000 so that is when the research was done on in captivity but in in the wild uh, we don't have much work it's it's the least known primate in in india probably one of the least known primate in the world so <laughs> no because it's quite interesting because if the females can get uh, into heat only twice in a year so obviously their metabolism and physiology is totally different from completely different yes so and different that they don't have threats no no animal wants to eat a loris that's very astonishing so they have been around you know for many many millions of years but no animal wants to eat them <laughs> so, so that's how different they are so, so there are no many no more questions uh, right now i hand over the session to harshita uh, madam yes komal you can start the volume comparing uh, yes thank you so much sir thank you so much madam now uh, uh, now i would like to request dr vaishali somni madam to summarize the series vaishali madam thank you komal madam it was a fantastic session uh, quite inspiring for all the students thank you smita madam for the great session i am happy to be here to present concluding remark for our unique activity women of matter talk series to celebrate azadi ka amrit mahotsav uh, when dr golden quarters proposed this unique idea to invite the speakers under this theme of environment conservation biodiversity and habitat studies the entire md college several departments came forward to cover different aspects under this theme of environment biodiversity resource management protection and conservation marshi dayanan college of arts science and commerce uh, affiliated to university of mumbai includes environment sensitization as our mission statement we started on 15th december 2021 with this series with madam devika from sepon sharing her experiences and research about spiders yes though it was a challenge for us to complete the 75 sessions when the covid was going on still i must say the journey was beautiful and we are completing today it was not only about environment and biodiversity but also about how these women researchers accept the challenge the interaction revealed what sort of difficulties are faced and how these women researchers with their passion determination and hard work successfully achieve their goals these sessions are great enrichment opportunity for our young students and all other participants inspiring the young mind the topic included solid waste management population and environment 
carbon footprints, mangrove conservation, wetland ecotourism, sustainable living, relationship of literature and environment. We covered almost everything from mountains to coastal caves and many more. There was always takeaway message, motivation and guidance provided in each and every session. Few sessions were conducted in Marathi and Hindi languages. The speakers included hardcore researchers, experienced senior scientists, academicians, activists, some young researchers and nature lovers. There were young researchers just out of their PG sharing their field experiences for benefit of entire student community and each and everyone sensitive about environment. We have uploaded these sessions on YouTube channel of our institute, that is YouTube channel of MD College. I think this will be a great knowledge bank for all of us and many more can use these for reference. It will continue to inspire the young minds further. This is my sincere request to all the participants to watch these sessions on YouTube if you have missed any of this. Maharshi Dhanan College of Arts, Science and Commerce, affiliated to University of Mumbai and Envis Second Coimtur, Tamil Nadu. We hereby together conclude the Women of Matter talk series. This is our humble contribution for Azharika Amrits Mahotsav. Thank you, Second, for your collaboration. And I sincerely thank all the resource person for the grand support which they have given for this enrichment activity. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Madam. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. Uh, now I request Ms. Suprita Naik, Madam, to propose a formal vote of thanks and conclude today's program. Thank you, Komal, Madam. I take this opportunity to thank our honorable speaker, Ms. Smita Nyan Olivu, for sharing her valuable expertise and for sharing her experience on field study about slender learners. Thank you so much, Madam, for such a wonderful presentation. I would also like to thank all the 75 resource persons from different organizations who have shared their research, their experiences and expertise on the topic and contributing to the Women of Matter Talk series, celebrating the 75 years of independence. I extend my gratitude towards MDC Kaval Verma Madam and our principal Dr. Chaya Panse Madam for their constant support and guidance. I would like to thank Dr. Golden Quadra sir and all the members of NVSECON. I would like to thank all the faculty members from different college under University of Mumbai and the researchers from different organizations for joining us. I would also like to thank my teacher colleagues from zoology department, BMS EME for their co uh, coordination and all the other departments for their support and contribution in bringing these 75 sessions of Women of Matter Talk series successfully. I also want to thank Mr. Ayapan Pillay, uh, Swapnil, and Raj Rajesh sir for their constant technical support throughout the session. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the dear participants who have joined us on Zoom and on YouTube from different places. Thank you, everyone. Before we end the program, I request all the dear participants on the Zoom to switch on their cameras for a good photo. Please, everyone, can you switch on your cameras so that we can have a good photo? Done? Yes, I thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Sita, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank, thank you, you, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much for having thank me you. here. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Smita, for the wonderful talk. Yeah. And thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank for you this exciting journey. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Yeah. See you in the next talk. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.